I've kept quiet about my opinion on the David Suchet adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express, mostly because I didn't want to tip my hat until I could explain where I'm coming from. Well, it's time for me to say it. I despise this adaptation. I loathe it. But can I say it's the worst adaptation of the book? When the Kenneth Branagh adaptation came out, it was just a few months after my divorce. I was in a dark place emotionally, so I decided, before viewing it, that I was going to enjoy this movie, regardless of whether it was actually good or bad, because I needed to. And I did. And when I told my sister I enjoyed it, her response was, Who are you, and what have you done with my brother? Well, I'm not in a dark place anymore, so I can look at this film more objectively. Someone suggested doing another adaptation tournament, like I did with And Then There Were None, but that really wouldn't work here, because this version, at least, is so bad it would never qualify, and I wouldn't get to talk about it. So I'm going to do something a little different, a contest to decide which of these films is the champion for worst adaptation of the novel. At this point, I want to acknowledge that these are just my opinions. I know from past comments that there are fans of both these films out there, and my opinions are no more or less valid than yours. Here we go. Obviously, the Albert Finney version is disqualified by virtue of it being cinematic gold. So too with the Alfred Molina version made and set in 2001, which I found a bit silly, but altogether not that bad. The Japanese version I haven't seen yet. Murder on the Orient Express, also titled Murder in the Calais Coach, was first published in 1934. It was the eighth novel to feature Hercule Poirot. Shortly after solving two cases in Iraq and Syria, the former depicted in Murder in Mesopotamia, Poirot travels to Istanbul by train. He intends to spend a few days there as a tourist, but at the last minute he receives a telegram recalling him to London on an urgent case. There should be no trouble about this, as the Orient Express has seldom traveled this time of year, but surprisingly it's fully booked. Fortunately, Poirot is old friends with the director of the line, Monsieur Bouc, who makes sure Poirot gets a berth. Poirot observes the other passengers on the train. Aside from Mary Debenham, an Englishwoman whose behavior seems inconsistent, the one who makes the strongest impression on him is Mr. Ratchet, an American millionaire. Ratchet approaches Poirot and offers him a large sum of money to find out who's threatening his life. Poirot refuses, given a deep-felt instinct that this man is evil. That night, the train runs into a snowdrift and becomes stuck. Poirot has the compartment beside Ratchet's. He hears some noises and voices next door, and in the morning, Ratchet's body is found, stabbed to death. Let's start by looking at the 2010 version, starring David Suchet. It begins with Poirot angrily confronting a soldier. Why is he so angry? Is the soldier a murderer? No, although it seems he lied to protect his marriage. Poirot shames him, unintentionally, we assume, into committing suicide. The book is vague about the problem Poirot solved in Syria before the story begins, but it does mention a suicide. However, that conclusion seemed to bring relief to those who knew what was going on, probably because it somehow avoided a scandal. Here, it's clearly a tragedy. Poirot dismisses such a notion, placing the blame entirely on the dead soldier, again, simply for having lied. Setting aside the fact that Book Poirot has never been so excessively vindictive, there have been plenty of times in the Poirot TV series where he's brought someone's lies to light without flying into a rage, let alone indirectly causing a suicide. But then again, ever since the murder of Roger Ackroyd in 2000, there has been an upswing in Poirot losing emotional control. What have I done? It is you who have deceived me! Now, the screenwriters have every right to present their own interpretation of the character, but do they really think that someone who loses their cool is easier to root for than someone who knows how to draw out the truth through careful choice of words and actions? The story gets back on track with Poirot eavesdropping on Mary Debenham and Colonel Arbuthnot in Istanbul, but diverges again when the three of them witness the stoning, and I assume killing, of a woman who's pregnant by adultery. Mary is devastated, while Poirot, one scene later, seems completely unperturbed. Later, when he meets Mary, he says, Justice is, is often upsetting to witness. Justice? She had not killed anyone. No, but she had broken the rules and she knew what that would mean. Again, where did this trait of moral absolutism come from? This goes so far that it's not even consistent with TV series Poirot. Those women should hang. You are very harsh. Don't judge me too harshly. Oh, mademoiselle, I investigate. I do not judge. Well, apparently he does now. 
Well, you are not too distressed by what happened, I hope. Yes, of course I am. This is really straining believability, to the point where it's becoming insulting. Story-wise, there's nothing else worth commenting on in this part, other than the fact that one passenger, American Mr. Hardman, is left out. The religious stuff I'll talk about later. The 2017 production starring Kenneth Branagh changes the starting location to Jerusalem. This new rendition of Poirot is immediately established as fussy, but likable. Sometimes he's serious, and sometimes he's hard to take seriously. But thankfully, not quite to the extent of 1960s Poirot actor Tony Randall. When he meets Mary, he shows off his observational skills in the style of Sherlock Holmes, which makes me wonder whether today's screenwriters know of any other way to portray sleuth characters. At least the way they sum up Poirot's personality is semi-accurate. I can only see the world as it should be. It makes most of life unbearable. But it is useful in the detection of crime. Poirot uses theatrics and slapstick comedy to solve a local theft. Then he says, There is right. There is wrong. There is nothing in between. Please note, they've just set him up to have the same kind of ethical dilemma as in the 2010 version. Without stoning an innocent woman to death or turning Poirot into a pious dick waffle. As for the other characters, they're a little easier to remember than in 2010, partly because they all get way more screen time. Some of them are introduced creatively, others require a martial arts demonstration. I did like the exchange between the missionary and Monsieur Bouc. Sin does not agree with me. We should no longer speak. However, there are some character alterations we need to go over. The original list of suspects was as follows. Hector McQueen, Ratchet's secretary. Edward Masterman, Ratchet's valet. Mary Debenham. Colonel Arbuthnot. Arbuthnot. Whatever. Mrs. Hubbard. Princess Dragomirov. Her maid, Hildegard Schmidt. Greta Olson, a missionary. Antonio Foscarelli. Cyrus Hardman. Count and Countess Andrenyi, and Pierre Michel, the conductor. For the new film, Arbuthnot has become a doctor, replacing Dr. Constantine from the book, who was in a different train car when the murder occurred. Foscarelli is replaced by Biniamino Marquez, a car salesman, and Miss Olsen has become Pilar Estravados, which is the name of a character from Hercule Poirot's Christmas. I can understand changing the character's nationality so they could cast Penelope Cruz, but did they have to use that name? Two other big differences from the book. Instead of a snowdrift, the train is derailed by an avalanche, and... Ma chère Catherine. Who the hell is Catherine? Well, 2010, I'd say you're in the lead for worst adaptation. 2017 might be a bit extra, but by this point it's by far the more palatable of the two. Maybe we don't have to go through the whole thing. As long as 2017 doesn't do anything stupid... Why are you dead yet? Okay, let's keep going. In the book, Poirot finds a plethora of seemingly contradictory clues. Some say there was one killer, some say there were two. Some point to the killer being a passenger, some indicate he was an outsider disguised as a conductor, or as a woman in a kimono. Some show that the crime took place between midnight and 1 a.m., others imply it was later. Some portray the murder as impulsive, a crime of passion, though Poirot is given to believe it was very carefully planned. Although Monsieur Bouc and Dr. Constantine are apt to jump to conclusions, Poirot is more reticent. For him, almost nothing is certain. Any or all of these clues might have been planted. There are too many clues. The only clue he gives full credence to is a fragment of burned paper with the name Daisy Armstrong written on it. From this, Poirot infers that Ratchet was in truth the mastermind behind the kidnapping and murder of the child of a wealthy American family. Not to mention he was indirectly responsible for the deaths of her father, mother, unborn younger sibling, and a household maid. One by one, Poirot interviews the 13 suspects, one conductor and 12 passengers. Again, there seems to be contradictory testimony, yet certain details tie in with each other, pointing more and more to the theory of the killer having come from outside. Poirot might suspect an element of complicity, except none of the suspects who corroborate each other have ever met before this train trip. A few of them have connections to the Armstrong case, but they all have alibis, again, from fellow passengers with whom they have no prior association. Suddenly, Mrs. Hubbard produces the murder weapon, saying she found it in her bag. This is added to the growing list of evidence that the killer used her compartment to enter and or leave ratchets. 
Poirot begins to see his way to the solution, but he speaks to many of the suspects at least once more. Through a mix of inspiration and deduction, he finds that actually several of them have connections to Daisy Armstrong. Aunt, uncle, nurse, godmother, secretary, chauffeur, war buddy, and son of the district attorney. Poirot even says it's possible that Miss Schmidt and Mrs. Hubbard might fit in as cook and housekeeper. Both Mr. Book and Mr. Hardman say, they can't all be in it, to which Poirot responds by asking everyone to assemble, as he has two solutions to lay before them. In the 2010 version, the timing of the night's events are altered slightly. For instance, the train isn't stopped by the snowdrift until 2 a.m. In addition to the murder, there is also a robbery of $200,000, which, when Poirot hears this exact amount, clues him in that this is to do with the Armstrong case, for that was the exact amount of the ransom demand. As in the book, the conductor's uniform is found in Hildegard's luggage, but they skip the discovery of the kimono in Poirot's compartment, both disguises the hypothetical outsider used to infiltrate the train. An additional obstacle in the film is that the heat, water, and electricity all cut out, so the characters must huddle together for warmth, and are doing so when Poirot gives to them his two solutions. Other things I noticed, Poirot does a lot of the doctor's job for him because the doctor is now an obstetrician. The most the doctor ever does is get in Poirot's way, especially during the interviews. Book keeps unlocking and entering guests' compartments without their consent, which I find highly implausible even under these circumstances. Lastly, this middle section zips by really fast, omitting or postponing several important clues and revelations. Returning to the 2017 version, um, Poirot, why are you on top of the train? Please come down. Like 2010, this film moves at a breakneck pace, though it's geared more toward pulling off thrills than building tension. Despite some embellishments, such as Colonel Armstrong having contacted Poirot to ask for help finding Daisy, though it was already too late, the story keeps to the book until a chase scene in which McQueen attempts to burn evidence that he embezzled money from Ratchet. They come close to arresting McQueen, but then the murder weapon is found, in Mrs. Hubbard's back! This seems to clear both Mrs. Hubbard and McQueen. The passengers are taken off the train while the engine is put back on the track, but for some reason Poirot questions Mary in one of the cars, which is a good thing, it turns out, because when Poirot accuses Mary of being the killer, Dr. Arbuthnot suddenly turns up, confesses, and shoots at Poirot, triggering another fight sequence. Poirot is saved by the re-railing of the train and by Book's timely intervention. Several of these dialogue scenes were well done, particularly between Poirot and Masterman, who it turns out is dying. I found it interesting that Poirot put his ten questions from the book to Mary instead of Book. Having each suspect's interview take place in a different setting is a clever visual way to represent Poirot's method in the book of varying his interrogation tactics. Sadly, the creativity here is overshadowed by cliché. On several occasions, Poirot uncharacteristically loses his temper or jumps to conclusions, or he seems to. It might be another interrogation tactic, but it's not clear. What is clear is that these and other certain plot elements have been thrown in to up the drama and make the film more exciting, regardless of plausibility, much like the avalanche from earlier. Poirot gets into physical altercations with three of the suspects, which might have been funny the first time I watched it, but later I thought about how intriguing Arbuthnot is when he is introduced. I wanted to dive further into his character, but instead our payoff with him is, Why aren't you dead yet? I'll trade spectacle for character depth any day. The first solution Poirot puts forth in the book is that the killer was the enemy Ratchet had hired Private Eye Hardman to protect him from. The murderer snuck onto the train disguised as a conductor, killed Ratchet, escaped through Mrs. Hubbard's compartment, ditched the disguise, and left the train. Poirot says the smashed watch gave the correct time of death, except Ratchet had forgotten to change it when they crossed time zones, so the murder had been committed earlier than they thought. The doctor says this theory is absurd, but Poirot warns him he might soon change his mind. The second solution, and of course the true one, is often oversimplified when described. They all did it! Agatha Christie could have incorporated this solution with hardly any effort at all, but instead she crafted a masterpiece. 
The twelve murderers are analogous to the twelve members of a jury. With Poirot unexpectedly joining them on the train, plus the snowdrift, they had to make some last-minute modifications to their plan. They'd worked it out carefully so no innocent person might be implicated. The murder was committed later than it seemed, as each friend or family member of Ratchet's five victims entered his room and stabbed him one at a time. Arbuthnot was Colonel Armstrong's best friend, Hardman the boyfriend of the French maid who killed herself, and the conductor her father. Mrs. Hubbard was Daisy's grandmother, Linda Arden, one of the greatest actresses in the world. The only one of them who didn't strike a killing blow, Poirot guesses, was Daisy's Aunt Helena. Mrs. Hubbard drops her facade and begs Poirot to place the blame on her. She says there had been other child victims before Daisy. There might have been more in the future. Book and Constantine endorse the first solution, and Poirot retires from the case. The 2017 adaptation fills Act 3 with extraneous, overcharged dialogue. Poirot speaks a lot of words, but says very little. He touches on one or two of the clues mentioned before, but the melodrama eclipses their significance, so they might as well have been left out. In fact, the time of the crime is moved to much earlier, before the train is even stopped. Even though Ratchet has been drugged, they have to physically keep him from crying out. The suicidal maid is changed from Pierre's daughter to sister, and while they don't mention the fact that Helena didn't stab Ratchet, she's not seen among the murderers in the flashback. The decision to alter the time of the murder is especially questionable in that the false clues were meant to fool Poirot into thinking the murder occurred right before he heard someone cry, Cenarien. In this case, the murder did occur at that point, and the only conceivable reason for this choice is the shock value at the end. Zenaria. Anyway, Mrs. Hubbard makes her grand appeal to Poirot, but I personally didn't feel as moved by her speech here as in the book. Apparently neither does Poirot, for he decides to test her morality. He gives her a gun and tells her she must kill him in order to protect everyone. Instead, Linda tries to shoot herself but the gun isn't loaded. Poirot's final lines to the conspirators are, in my opinion, actually well chosen. For once, the filmmakers recognized there was no need to go over the top, and this is allowed to be a powerful moment. Then, as Poirot disembarks, we get a setup for the sequel, Death on the Nile, which did not fill me with enthusiasm. What this ending says is that everything that's happening is about Poirot, whereas if they'd ended it a minute sooner, we could have left it on a note that everything's not about him after all. In the 2010 version, Poirot starts out having no intention of letting the conspirators go free, but he still begins his summation by saying there are two solutions. As he goes over everyone's connection to the Armstrongs, it comes out that Ratchet threatened to kill McQueen if his father, the prosecutor, didn't throw the case. And because this Poirot doppelganger has no compassion, he condemns McQueen's dad for not doing his job regardless. Since Foscarelli and Hardman are combined as characters, the 13th conspirator is Dr. Constantine, the Armstrong's obstetrician and family friend. It's the princess who volunteers to take all the blame instead of Mrs. Hubbard. Poirot tears into the conspirators for their actions, and when they point out why he's wrong, he flies into a rage full of religious invective and pious indignation. The rule of law, it must be held high. And if it falls, you pick it up and hold it even higher! Oh, it's a higher justice than the rule of law, monsieur. Then you let God administer it, not you! For the first time not being annoying, Book advocates for giving the police the pseudo-solution, but Poirot goes full-on Javert and locks up all thirteen conspirators. Arbuthnot comes close to shooting his way out, but Mary dissuades him, proving that Poirot's rant was wrong, that in choosing as they did, these people did not do away with their moral boundaries. Mary speaks with Poirot one last time, not to plead for her freedom, but to make a final statement. When you've been denied justice, it feels that God has abandoned you. But I did what was right. This is the last in a series of instances highlighting the theme of religion, Catholicism in particular. This film character's values and moral code all seem directly tied to his faith in God, something the latter half of the TV series stressed more and more. When Poirot decides at the very end to let the conspirators go, he's clearly shaken to his core. Apparently Mary's words have swayed him, weakened his skewed perspective. Whether or not he's done the right thing is upstaged by the betrayal he feels he's committed to his faith, to God, and to himself. 
Hopefully without going too much on a tangent, even though this crisis of faith is powerful and evocative, I'm still disappointed that the series, and this film in particular, decided to make Christianity a cornerstone of Poirot's character. Christianity might not be all one thing, but historically, in many forms, it tends to be pervasive and harmful, especially to those who don't conform. If there's anyone who ought to be a champion of nonconformity, it's Poirot! That's part of why he's my hero. Another part is his morality, which takes the form of understanding and wisdom, not judginess. Christianity is not the source of a person's morality. Humanity is. If this character isn't aware of that, then he's not my Poirot. In any case, I see this film as a pseudo-adaptation, for a story about a man with moral absolutism losing his faith is very different from a story about justice being achieved through unorthodox means. The book's ending might be slightly ambiguous, but the protagonist's final action was not meant to be deeply personal or a crushing ethical dilemma. Poirot's goal in the third act is not to make up his mind, but to help Book and Constantine make up their minds. He's already decided these people should be let go, and when they are, I have the honor to retire from the case. 2010 made the story as much about the protagonist as 2017 did, and 2017 starred Kenneth Branagh. So, which one of these films is the worst adaptation? First, we need to acknowledge that neither of these films is a close adaptation. One of them features a main character who might share the same name as the detective in the book, but in personality, there's a sharp contrast. The other film largely retains the book's plot and theme, but the tone is too different to count as an accurate depiction. Did we die? Next, we have to decide whether 2010 should be judged on its own or as part of a series. Although a foundation is set in a few previous TV films for Poirot's religious inclinations blown out of proportion, as well as his rising tendency to be a harsh, judgmental dickbag, the vast majority of entries in this series portray Poirot faithfully. So 2010 is a divergence not just from the book, but from its own antecedents. With that in mind, I'm going to say we can only judge this film as a single entity. Therefore, both films must prove their worseness by their qualities just as films, not as adaptations. One protagonist can barely be taken seriously, but we're given to believe that he's kind and honorable. The other is very serious, but throws around contempt, condescension, and vitriol, saying heinous things by which listeners are understandably repelled. In one film, the clues to the mystery all make a token appearance, but their importance is downplayed, making them easy to forget. Our attention is drawn more to the characters. The tension is built less on the evidence and more on suspicion based on dialogue and behavior. The story is less a murder mystery and more a drama, where the mystery contributes to the mood. The same is largely true of the other film, except that the clues in the case are obvious rather than set-dressing. The attempts to mislead Poirot are clumsier, the suspect's lies far less convincing. The doctor pieces together the false clues so quickly that we know they're red herrings. Story-wise, this choice makes sense, as the discovery that these clues are false would be one too many turning points, now that they've added the turning point of Poirot's momentous personal decision. This is not an easy contest. Both films are weak, but in ways that are difficult to weigh against each other. I have a confession to make. My original intention was to end this video on a humorous note. I would declare a tie, and then there would be a last-minute entry, the computer game, which I'm told has a ludicrous ending, and it would be the winner. However, upon re-watching these films, I realized... The 2010 version is disturbing and offensive. But, of these two, it is the better made film. Which is bloody aggravating. I want to say that 2010 is the worst, but 2010 has something that 2017 doesn't. Consistency. Consistency within itself. 2017's writing feels driven by what would evoke the strongest reaction from the audience, rather than what would these characters do next. Maybe that writing choice made them more money, but it's still sloppy storytelling. I might despise the story told by 2010, and I hope I never have to see it again, but it told its story well. 2017 chose its story and then infused it with silly spectacle and arbitrary shock value, no matter if it weakened its plot, for it would attract a bigger audience. In a word, it's... 
dumb. It's so dumb. And that is why 2017 is the worst murder on the Orient Express. Well, I think I'm going to round out the year by covering something I can be a little more positive about. I will hopefully see you then. Thanks for watching.